Shalom and welcome to our series that we're doing on the various types of coverings uh, that we find throughout the scripture. Uh, everything from head coverings to the kupa to the sukkah. Uh, we're going to be centering on, uh, at the first, on the head coverings. Now, in our last uh, video that we put out, we talked about the priest in the temple that they were required to have a head covering on their head. In fact, it had a death penalty if they failed to do this when they were in the inner courtyard of the temple. This is when they had the priestly garments on. Now, we have, uh, uh, we're going to talk about halakha, uh, and we're going to talk about a Greek word called paradosis that means exactly the same thing. What exactly is halakha? Halakha is going to be how you keep a commandment. It stems from out of the book of Shemot or Exodus, chapter 18. This is where Yithro, or Jethro as you might know him, had the father-in-law of uh, Moshe, Moses, has come to meet him in the wilderness. And so uh, we're told that uh, Moshe judges the people. And I'm going to pick up at that point. This is going to be in chapter 18. And... Uh, we're going to be in verse 13. It says, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moshe sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moshe from the morning to the evening. By the way, I'm using a Koran Tanakh. Uh, and when Moshe's father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest for the people? Why dost thou sit alone and all the people stand by thee from morning to evening? And Moshe said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his Torah. Torah means his laws. And Moshe's father-in-law said to him, The thing that, you, that thou doest is not good. Thou, uh, thou will surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken thou to my voice. I'll give thee counsel, and may God be with thee. Be thou the link between the people and God, that thou mayest bring the cases to God, and thou shalt teach them the ordinances of the Torah, of the laws, and show them the way in which they should walk. All right, now that specifically is the definition you have a commandment that is given by God. That's going to be, uh, there are several different words for the types of commandments, but basically the laws that we have, the 613 commandments. The halakha is how you keep those commandments. Of the 613 commandments that are listed in the Torah, not one of them is explained. Every one of them is controversial. Now this passage that I just read from is going to become the foundation for what is called the Sanhedrin. We'll teach on that at another time. But we have this basic concept of halakha is the ruling, and that's going to be a ruling by the Sanhedrin on how you keep a commandment. And so we find uh, as we study out the Sanhedrin that God gave authority to the Sanhedrin in order to make those decisions, and they became binding upon the people. Now, <clears throat> we have, uh, in the Jewish law, we have several different categories of the law. This is going to be discussed in a book that, uh, that uh, my wife and I wrote together uh, called A Concise Guide to the Mishnah and the Tosefta. And so... Uh, there is a section here on the oral Torah in, in the introduction, and it goes into the uh, the five points of the law. Now, I don't want to read all of this because it would frankly take too long, but I want to put on the board, I have here the term halakha, and it comes from the word holak. Now, holak means to walk. So, uh, halakha is literally how one walks in the commandments, okay? So it, it defines it. It gives you uh, borders. It gives you definition and so forth. Now, so we have these five categories of laws and a list from one to five. And so the highest is going to be literally 
one of the 613 uh, mitzvot or commandments that we have in the Torah. Okay, one of the 613, like the Ten Commandments, like what we read uh, in our last video about how that the Kohen has to have something on his head, and if he doesn't have something on his head, then he's subject to die. Okay, so we have uh, our second level is going to be where we have a commandment found elsewhere in the scripture. Now, these commandments are actually going to be based on what we have in the Torah. It's not going to be some new commandment that is going to be out there making a 614th commandment, but rather we're told to honor the Shabbat. So in the book of Ezra, we find that, uh, that Ezra says that you may not buy and sell on the Sabbath, which is part of honoring the Shabbat. But it's found in the book of Ezra, not in the five books of the Torah. Then we have uh, a, uh, a commandment that is derived from the 613. I'll give you an example. We have Again, in the book of, uh, this is in Nehemiah, Nehemiah, we have where the people are instructed to bring the wood offering as instructed in the Torah. But you can read the entire Torah and there never is a wood offering that is listed. What is listed is that you have to have a perpetual fire on the altar. In order to have a fire on the altar, you have to have a fuel for that fire. And so it's a commandment that is derived from the 613. The third, or the fourth level, is going to be a uh, rabbinic decree. Now, the rabbinic decree also has to be based on scripture. The example of this would be like prose bowl. Prose bowl uh, it was passed by Hillel. Uh, Hillel the elder who died in Tin Common Era. Uh, he was the Nasi of the Sanhedrin. They had a situation because since the time of the end of the first temple, they had not had the Jubilee. At the Jubilee, all of the lands returned back to their original owners. Now, because that uh, of no Jubilee, because uh, they have to have all the people in the land, uh, it created a loophole that the uh, Certain individuals were taken advantage of, and the poor were, were suffering. So he issued a decree called Prosbol in order to deal with this problem. Now, the, the fifth level is called Customs. Now, Customs. And I'm going to write the Greek word for Customs, and uh, you'll understand why in just a moment. It is the word Athos. Now, Customs, where we have a Torah commandment, that you were to have a pails on the, the, or that you're not to cut the corners of your hair, the corners of your beard. And so while one group might have their pails to be very long and another group might have them to be braided or another group might have them where they put them over the back of their ears, there's different customs for different groups, but it's not a change of the commandments. Okay, so having said all that, we're going to to go... And we're going to go to the New Testament. Now, what I want to see, we're going to look first at probably one of the most controversial, if not the most controversial individual in the entire New Testament. It's going to be Paul. Now, Paul is generally thought of as the father of a new religion, Christianity. And uh, I would disagree that, first off, uh, that he is not the father of what we call Christianity because today's Christianity is very different from what was there in the first century. And uh, 
We're going to go to Acts chapter 21. Now, in Acts chapter 21, we have Paul has come to Jerusalem uh, for from Ephesus, uh, excuse me, from uh, from out in Asia Minor, and he has traveled from uh, to Jerusalem to keep the festival of Shavuot, or what many Christians would call Pentecost. And so he comes, and we're told in chapter 21, verse 15, it says, And after those days we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Also, some of the Talmudim. You know, the Greek word here, or the English word we have is disciples, but a Talmud is the Hebrew word, and it means students. It's a much more powerful word. And some of the Talmudim from Caesarea went with us and uh, brought with them one Manasseh of Cyprus, an early Talmud with whom we were to lodge. And we assume that this man, based on his name, is not Jewish. When he come to Jerusalem. The brethren received us gladly. Now, when it says the brethren, it's talking about others that believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. On the following day, Paul went in with us to Jacob, or in English, it's James, Jacob, Jacob, who is the brother of Yeshua, the half brother of Yeshua, and he is the Nasi, or the president, the uh, the Rosh Knesset. He's the head of the believers in Jerusalem. It says that all the elders were present. Now, even though it doesn't list, list off the elders for us, we have to assume that if all the elders were present, and of course this is one of the pilgrimage festivals, Shavuot, we would expect that everybody would be coming to Jerusalem. Uh, that these elders are certainly going to include the what we call the Shlekim, or in English, it's called the apostles. Okay, These are the writers of the New Testament, along with Paul. And so it says, when he agreed to them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. They said to him, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed. Myriads means tens of thousands. And they're all zealous for the Torah. Now, from this passage and many, many other passages, we see the Jewish believers not departing from the Torah, but continuing to walk in the Torah. So what does this mean? It means they keep kosher, a kosher diet. It means that they observe the laws of purity, that they are going to observe the, the, the Torah uh, just as the other observant Jews that do not believe in Yeshua observe those commandments. And so it says, they have, but they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews or among the Gentiles to forsake Moshe, to forsake Moses. Now, what does that mean? That means to forsake or to depart from the Torah. And so, uh, let me find my place here. Uh, to forsake Moshe, say that they ought not to circumcise their children, which that is going to be one of our 613 mitzvot, that you are to circumcise your children on the eighth day, okay? Not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. Oh, wait a second. The customs is the lowest level of the five levels of Jewish law. It is, the Greek word that is used there is the word athos, and they specifically say, that everyone will know that you walk in the commandments, all the way from the 613 meets vote down to the customs. In other words, what they are saying is we want you to prove to the Jews who believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, as well as for the rest of the world, that they will be able to see that you, whatever you write in these epistles, is going to be based on Jewish law on the 613 commandments and the extension of that down through the ethos. And so we have, uh, here's what they they tell him to do. Verse 20, 22, it says, what then? The assembly must certainly be, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them. Now, to take a vow means that they are Nazarites. If we could go back to Acts 18, verse 18, 
And we see here, so Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. And this is where he's coming to Jerusalem. Syria actually was, Jerusalem was part of the province of Syria. He'd, he had had his hair cut off in Sicria for he'd taken a vow. So they tell him, we have four other men that have taken a Nazarite vow, and you be purified with them. It says, and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. And that all may know that those things in which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you also walk orderly and keep the Torah. So we can, well, and, and of course, Paul does this. Now, we can deduce from this that Paul was a Torah observant Jew. And he's going to make that statement. But we can also deduce that he not only is following the letter of the 613 commandments, but he's following the extension of all the levels of Jewish law. In other words, he is walking in the halakha. Now, the Greek word for halakha, I'm going to show this to you. It's going to be the word paradosis. Paradosis. And it's used repeatedly in the New Testament. I'll give you a list of these. It's often going to be translated as traditions or ordinances. But it is literally the Greek word for halakha. It was used by Flavius Josephus in his writings. Jewish general that wrote up. Uh, it was taken, to cap, uh, taken captive by the Romans, carried to Rome, wrote extensive volumes of the Jewish people, their history, and their wars. And so he used the word paradosis for halakha. Philo, the Jewish philosopher from Alexandria, Egypt, he uses the word paradosis for halakha. You can look it up in the various lexicons. I have the I've done printouts here of all the various lexicons and so forth. But I want to give you some of the passages here for paradosis. And so we have, for instance, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 2. This is where Yeshua is contending with the Pharisees from Beit Shemai. And, uh, excuse me, this is where the Pharisees from Beit Shemai are contending with Yeshua. And they say, why do your disciples transgress the paradosis or the halakha of the elders? That would be according to the house of Shemai for they do not wash their heads when they eat. Uh, we have Matthew 15, 3, 15, 6. Is going to continue with that. I'm going to go to Mark chapter 7. Uh, for uh, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their heads in a special way, holding the tradition or the halakha of the elders. We I would just want to get a few more of these. Uh, we have Colossians 2, 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy, and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Messiah. Again, this will be translated as halakha, but not a halakha of the Jewish people, but rather a halakha of the world. Now, <clears throat> why am I going into this? Because this is going to have everything to deal with the understanding of head coverings. And so I want to go to one passage. We're going to end up here. This will be where we pick up in our next session. And we have where Paul is writing in Corinthians. So let me recap something. It, it, we need to understand Paul is an observant Jew. And when he's writing about using the word paradosis and he's writing about halakha, he's not inventing a new halakha, but he's referring to the halakha of the Jewish people. So in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, he says, imitate me just as I also imitate Messiah. Now, I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the paradosis as I delivered it to you. Keep the halakha as I delivered it to you. Now, this is as far as we're going to go today. But this chapter is going to go into a very controversial topic, head coverings. Uh, about uh, Gentiles and Christians, they consider it uh, a godly to pray with your head cover. It is, uh, you lack manners. If you walk into a house and you don't take off your hat, if you sit at a table and you don't take off your hat. However, among the Jewish people, it's exactly the opposite. You are ungodly if you don't have your head covered 
whatever you pray. Uh, that, that you are basically, in their eyes, say, oh, I don't need uh, anyone above me. I am fine as I am. In Judaism, you have to be under the umbrella of God. And so there's going to be, when you pray, you put on a head covering. You go up on the temple mount, you put on a head covering. You go to the hotel to pray, you put on a head covering. So we're going to discuss all this, and we'll go into the head covers, and I, I think that it'll open your eyes to a few things. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, I hope you enjoyed the the teaching we just went through. We have more that we have planned, but I'd like to show you my newest book. This is called Measure the Pattern, Volume 1. It deals with the latest research on the Holy Temple. It shows definitively exactly where the temple building was, all the various structures, the courtyards, and more than I can describe here. Go to our website. There's a link below and check the book out.